Hello students, this is Professor Osaya and uh, this is part two of uh, chapter 13 presentation, current liabilities and uh, contingencies. This is where we left off in part one, notes payable. We talked about the overview of notes payable and uh, we left off with the application. So the bank agrees to lend uh, $100,000 to this company uh, on March 1st, 2014 and the company records the journal entry as uh, such. Cash is debited for 100,000, notes payable is credited for $100,000. I want you to make a note of uh, a couple of things. Number one, the uh, note was, we issued the note on March 1st, 2014, uh, 6% uh, four month note. So. Uh, this is the journal entry that was recorded on March 1st. And let's take a look at uh, what happened uh, on June, at the end of June. Now, uh, the payment is due on July 1st. So at the end of June, assuming that the company is preparing their financial statement uh, every six months. So at the end of June, they need to accrue for the interest uh, uh, for the four, four months period from March 1st uh, through uh, June uh, 30th. So $100,000 as you know to calculate interest uh, principles times uh, rate times time. Uh, six percent multiplied by 412 because it is a four month note. So we have $2,000. So interest expense is debited for 2000 Interest payable is credited for 2000 That is at June 30th. Then on July 1st, when the note actually matures, when it is time to make a payment, uh, uh, that is, we are going to make a payment for the note, we are not only going to pay the interest, but we are also going to pay the principal as well. So we cover out uh, $102,000. So we credit cash for $102,000. We debit notes payable for $100,000 to get rid of the notes payable in our books. And we create and uh, we debit uh, interest payable for two thousand dollars. And of course, as you can see, interest expense is no longer applicable here because at the end of June, uh, we already recognized the related interest expense in that uh, accounting uh, uh, period. So moving along, let's take a look at uh, 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 the uh, still talking about notes payable zero interest uh, bearing notes. Uh, first of all, the name here is really misleading when we talk about the uh, zero interest bearing note. One would be tempted that uh, there is no interest in this note, but in actuality, what they actually mean is on the face of the note, that is the promissory note that we are issuing, promising to pay X, Y, Z, there is no interest rate specified on the face of the note. However, there is an interest element in the note. Because there is no interest rate specified on the face of the note, hence we call it a zero interest bearing note. But in actuality, there is interest. So let's take a look at that example here. So on March 1st, we issue a note uh, 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 for $102,000. This is a four month zero interest bearing note because interest is not gonna be paid uh, on a periodic basis and there is no interest on the face of the note. So the present value of the note is $100,000. So let's take a look at how we record the transaction. We receive only $100,000 from the bank. So we debit $100,000, we debit cash for $100,000. Then we credit note payable for $102,000. So that is what we are going to be coughing out uh, on maturity date. So the $2,000 difference is debited to discount on note payable. Why are we not debiting interest expense at this point? Because that $2,000 is actually uh, interest expense to us. We are not debiting interest expense right now because this is the beginning of the contractual relationship. All right? The, 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 there is no interest expense because the time has not elapsed yet. So now let's take a look at uh, what happens. On day one, if we were to... Now, I'm not talking about recording, I'm talking about reporting. If we were to report this, uh, this transaction on the balance sheet, take a look at what happened. Uh, under current liabilities, we said note payable is 102000 
less discount on note payable. Discount on note payable is a contra account to note payable. So uh, uh, note payable has a normal credit balance. Discount on note payable has a normal debit balance. So uh, subtracted 2,000 from 102, that will give you uh, 100,000. So on day one, we are actually obligated to pay, uh, we are actually obligated only for $100,000. But at the end of four months, we are now going to be obligated for $102,000. So let's take a look at how this plays out. So on September 1st, October 1st, now let's take a look at how the journal entry involved. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, uh. So as time progresses, the discount on note payable is going to be amortized on a monthly basis, assuming that we are preparing our financial statement on a monthly basis. Uh, so at the end of four months, the discount on note payable becomes zero and our note payable becomes 102,000. So it is now time for us to uh, cough out 102,000. So over four months period, we would have recognized $2,000 in interest expense over uh, the, time, uh, over the uh, four months period by way of decreasing note discount on note payable and uh, recognizing the related uh, interest expense. So moving along, uh, here are additional examples uh, illustrating accounts and notes payable. We have already talked about accounts and notes payable extensively in uh, principles of accounting, so we are not going to spend too much time uh, on this. So you can go through these additional illustrations uh, yourself. So moving along, let's take a look at uh, the next issue. The next issue is uh, current maturities of long-term debt. Now, current maturities of long-term debt is the third example of current liability that we are going to talk about. So we are going to talk about the accounting principles and the applications, okay? So let's take a look at the issues that we need to know. Uh, first of all, what are current maturities of long-term debt? Let me just give you an example. You, our company borrowed a million dollars from the bank, and we promised the bank that we are going to pay $100,000 every year uh, uh, for the next 10 years. Just to make it very simple, forget about interest right now. So if we borrow the money um, 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 at the end of February this year, and the first $100,000 is due February next year, December this year, the first $100,000 is going to be paid within two months at the end of this year. So at the end of this month, the $100,000 that is due February of next year is considered as current maturity of this long-term debt of this $1 million. So December this year, we need to recognize $100,000 as current liability, then $900,000 as long-term liability. That is basically what current maturities of long-term uh, uh, debt is all about. So here are the rules. Uh, here we say that portion of bonds, mortgage, mortgage notes, and other long-term indebted that matures within the next fiscal year. So these are different examples. Now, here are some rules that you need to pay attention to. Number one, here we are told that we need to exclude long-term debt maturing currently if they are to be one, retired by assets accumulated that have not been shown as current assets. Two, refinance or retire from the proceeds of a new debt issue, or three, converted into capital stock. Now, what does that mean? What they are saying here is, let's take a look at number one. You have to understand these rules in order for you to be able to apply them. So number one here, they say that uh, we should not, we should exclude long-term debt maturing currently. In other words, we should exclude them from reporting them as current liabilities if number one if they are to be retired by assets accumulated that have not been shown as current uh, assets what does that mean let's take a look at an example Let, let's assume that uh, we borrowed uh, 
about $500,000 in long-term debt. So we borrow half a million dollars in long-term debt. Every year, we set aside in a particular bank account of ours $100,000 every year with the anticipation of paying off the half a million dollars. So listen to this very carefully. At the end of the year, the $1,000 that we set aside in one particular account, if that $100,000 is not classified as current asset, then the $100,000 that is due within a year should not be considered as current liability either. So let's take it again. Exclude from long-term, exclude long-term debt maturing currently if they are to be retired by assets accumulated that have not been shown as current assets. So the $100,000 that we have been putting away, as long as they are not considered as current assets, then the $100,000 that is due every year should not be classified as current liabilities either. So number two, refinance or retire for the proceeds of a new debt issue. What does that mean? That means at the end of the year, even though the portion of the long-term debt is going to be due like two or three months, as long as we refinance it or we retired it from the proceeds of a new debt, in other words, we got into another debt to get rid of that debt as long as it's long term, then we should not be included in current uh, liabilities. Then number three, if the long term debt maturing currently are converted into common stock, in other words, be converted into common stock or preferred stock, then uh, to capital stock, then it should not be considered as uh, current uh, liabilities. Now, let's take a look at. Uh, 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 we are going to talk about the application of these rules uh, uh, in a minute. So let's take a look at the, the second objective. Um, um, uh, explain the classification issue of short-term debt expected to be refinanced. So, uh, so we are going to exclude from current liabilities if both of the following conditions are met. So we are zeroing in on uh, 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 the current portion of the long-term debt that is expected to be due within a year. So let's take a look at the additional rules relative to that rule. Exclude from current liabilities if both of the following conditions are met. Number one, must intend to refinance the obligation on long-term debt. So that portion that is going to be due within a year should not be considered as current liability as long as you intend to refinance it into long-term debt. And number two, talk is cheap. You have to demonstrate an ability to actually refinance it, either by actually getting into actual refinancing it, or you enter into a financing uh, agreement. So take a look at uh, how all these things played out, or all these rules played out in terms of short-term obligations expected to be refinanced. Number one. If management intends to refinance, yes. Then, does management demonstrate ability to refinance? Yes. After refinancing, after balance sheet date, before the issue date, then exclude the short-term obligation from current liabilities. Now, management intends to refinance? No. Then classifies as current liability. Or, financing agreement not cancelable with a capable lender? That is no. Then. Uh, you should exclude the uh, uh, short-term obligations for current liabilities and reclassify as a, a long-term debt. So basically, this diagram summarizes uh, the rules that we just explained. And, it, and, and you are going to have a better understanding of this by the time we take a look at some of the applications. So let's take a look at uh, one application, the application of some of the rules that we just talked about. And I think... Uh, we are out of time for the second part of this presentation.